Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Riskologists. As always, I'm your host, Pat Bradshaw, and today joined by a very special guest. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with his excellent work over an illustrious career. I know I've certainly benefited from his brilliant content in my early tenure. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Hilson, or by his alias, The Risk Doctor. So David, thanks very much for coming on. Hi, Pat. It's really good to be here. I've enjoyed some of the earlier episodes and it's good to be able to contribute. Thanks for the opportunity. Excellent. No problem at all. The pleasure's all ours. So at this point, I would normally ask you how your podcast game is, but given your previous experience with this sort of thing, hopefully you won't be too far out of your comfort zone. I'm quite comfortable, thanks. <laughs> well, we'll see. It depends what questions you ask. I mean, maybe I won't be comfortable <laughs> in about 10 minutes. Who knows? Exactly. Perfect, David. So where I normally start with these things is just a little bit of a journey to date, really. I know I certainly be fascinated by that. So just really a little bit of an introduction of how you entered the risk profession, a brief timeline of your career and perhaps some some highlights and then what you're doing currently. So yeah, fire away. Sure, well, well I'm so old that uh, when I started, <laughs> there wasn't a risk profession to enter. Um, and maybe some of your um, you know old and bold uh, contributors might have a similar story. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'm an accidental risk specialist. Um, in 1984, so 35, 36 years ago, um, I started when I was really very young, you understand. Yes. Um, and um, <laughs> uh, I was uh, I was a junior project manager for a, a defence contractor in the south of England. Um, and uh, the, the MOD, the Ministry of Defence, mandated risk management on all major defence contracts uh, out of the blue, really. Um, nobody seemed to really be expecting it. And so all of the defence contractors were kind of scrabbling around trying to work out, well, how are we going to do risk management? So I was a junior project manager and um, somebody decided they would give me the job to find out what risk management was all about. Um, and to implement it on our project, which was a little bit struggling. Um, and so um, I went to the oil and gas sector, talked to some of the guys over there. Um, a good friend of mine, Professor Chris Chapman at the University of Southampton, who's not too far from where I live, got to know Chris a little bit and just sort of found out what some of the key ideas were and then started to implement them on our project. Um, so after that, um, it, it worked. We rescued the project. The project was actually quite a way behind schedule and uh, over budget it came in on budget on time they said it was due to risk management really good Amazing. and so would I like to help out some of the other projects um, and so I became the kind of in-house risk expert we ended up having a risk center of excellence uh, uh, I went through the kind of project routes and ended up uh, advising the um, the board and the the uh, chief executive on strategic and corporate risk and this is all in the kind of early uh, or late 80s early 90s really before risk management was, was very well established. And then in uh, 93, um, I went to, so it's about 10 years, um, I went to a small consultancy, a risk management consultancy, spent 10 years with two small risk consultancies. And then in 2003, launched the Risk Doctor Partnership, um, just doing risk management the way I wanted to with some trusted associates. And since then, we've worked in 60 countries around the world, uh, every continent except the Antarctic, much too cold, um, and pretty much every industry sector. And it's just been a fascinating ride. So starting off completely accidental and uh, really enjoying things, grabbing opportunities as they presented themselves and, and making the most of, uh, of the things that came in front of me. It's been great. Amazing. Yeah, as you probably will have noticed if you've listened to some of the um, some of the earlier episodes, 90 percent of the people, 99 percent of the people I have on always sort of accidentally fall into risk management. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's always interested to hear the background that they have. It's a question that I get quite often from others now to say, well, you know, how do I enter the risk management profession and what sort of certifications, qualifications, experience do I need and how did you do it? And of course, my story isn't any help to anybody because there were no certifications, qualifications or career path. Um, and it's quite hard to, to advise people nowadays uh, if they wanted to kind of follow in my footsteps. Somebody said to me once after a presentation, how long would it take me to get to be like you? And I said, well, about 30 years, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which isn't very helpful. Exactly. No, I think um, I think I'm obviously quite fortunate and everybody coming through now is I didn't um, personally studied risk management at university but it is a, a degree that they offer um, I'm quite fortunate that I've come in where all the groundwork is there all the key principles are there all the case studies are there whereas like you say it was something that you entered and I guess it was sort of starting from scratch really so would you say yourself and I've spoken to um, one of you one of your um, close associates Peter Simon in, in the past were sort of 
I guess, architects in a lot of the, the risk management principles and stuff that we have today, really. Yes, and, and I saw you had uh, Val Jonas as well, who I know really well. She's done some really great work. Um, it was a bit of a wild west to start with. I mean, we were following on from things that had been done in the oil and gas sector um, and a little bit in insurance, health and safety, finance, some of those other areas and drawing it together. But um, it's been a real privilege to be able to try and shape things in the last 30 years. And to so, so my motto is understand deeply so you can explain simply and trying to kind of distill all of these different things and to, to produce principles and processes and, and um, you know, sort of think things that make sense that people can use in practice. Um, so yeah, it's been a great privilege to, to try and to bring these things together and, and form a bit of a foundation that other people can build on. No, certainly I've, um, I'm very familiar with your brilliant work on like YouTube, for example. And um, I just find the way that you explain things that I may not have been able to get my head quite around really, really useful. And a lot of those little adages like you used a second ago, just sum things up perfectly. So, um, so no, thanks so much, David. Well, that's for good to hear. Done. Excellent. So as everyone will have seen, hopefully from the, uh, the title of the episode already, the topic of today's episode is all around emergent risk or black swans, as they're often referred to. So David, for the benefit of anyone listening who may not be familiar with this term, please could you give us some insight firstly into emergent risk or black swans, where the term black swan actually originates from and why these terms are inextricably linked? Well, uh, I'd like to, actually, I want to split the, split the question because I don't think black swans are the same as emergent risks. Okay. And there's a lot of, of confusion of putting the two together. Um, so black swans are really, really important. And I think that's what we're going to be spending our time talking about uh, in this podcast. Um, but they're mixed up with emergent risks. I think the truth is that black swans aren't risks at all. And there's something different. They're a different kind of creature which need to be handled in a, in a different way, which, which we'll talk about. Yes. Um, so a risk is an uncertainty that matters, something that uh, you, something you don't know about, but when and if and when it happens, it has an impact on our objectives. Um, the, the term black swan, um, actually, it comes originally, the earliest reference I found was a second century Roman poet called Juvenal, and he uh, wrote this poem and he referred to something that was so rare, it was like the possibility of a swan that's black. And uh, so the idea of a black swan has been around for, for nearly 2000 years, but it was popularized. Oh, and I suppose the reason that uh, he said that is that in the Western world for thousands of years, we knew for certain that all swans were white. So a swan is a, is a big bird, long neck, big wings, lives on water, and it's white. By definition, that's how we know what a swan is. And everybody believed that was just, um, uh, what do you call it, axiomatic. It was just obviously true. Yeah. Um, until I think it was 1697, and a Dutch explorer called Willem de Flaming uh, discovered Australia. And when he went to Australia, he discovered lots of new types of birds and animals, uh, things that had never been seen before, koalas and kangaroos and duckbill platypus. Uh, and this black bird, a big black bird, long neck, big wings, lives on water, black, clearly can't, can't, can't possibly be a, a swan because it's the wrong colour. So they put it in a completely different uh, scientific category, a, a scientific family. It wasn't Cygnus. It was uh, something else. I can't remember the name now. Um, and uh, so they said it can't possibly be a swan because, as we know, for hundreds of years, black swans are impossible. Um, and then they brought some uh, examples back to uh, Europe and uh, examined them and studied them and found they are exactly the same as white swans, apart from the feather colour. Um, so the idea of a black swan um, has emerged as something which is thought to be impossible, but turns out, in fact, to be true. Now, it was popularised in the risk management world in 2007 uh, by a Lebanese guy called Nicholas Nassim Taleb, and he wrote this book, this book here, um, this is, oh, not that book. That's another great book. Um, <laughs> this book, <laughs> here we are. Um, this is the book that he wrote in 2007. It's called um, Black Swans, the Impact of the Highly Improbable. Um, and in this book, he took that idea that there are things that we are absolutely convinced cannot be true until they're true, until yeah. we discover them. And he applied that into the world of risk. So he said uh, there, are, there are events that happen 
uh, which we are completely inconceivable. They're outside of our, of our frame of reference. So he gave three characteristics of black swans, three ways that you can know that one of these things is a black swan. First of all, it's completely unpredictable. It's inconceivable. It's outside of our frame of reference. We could never think of it. We, it's just unimaginable. So it's something we couldn't conceive. The second thing is that it has an extreme impact if and when it occurs. It's really big. And so it, it makes a big difference. And the third thing is that when we look back with hindsight, we say, oh, that was obvious. We should have seen that coming, but we didn't. Yeah. And so those are his three characteristics, completely inconceivable, really big impact and with hindsight predictable. Now, that's not the same as a risk. So emergent risks are risks that arrive from left field that have very low probability, but very high impact. But you could see them coming. That's the nature of risk. But here we've got something which is completely unimaginable, inconceivable. Um, we've even got a special word for it in risk management. We call it ontological uncertainty, which means it's, it's outside of your, of your frame of reference. You can't even conceive of it. So ontological uncertainty uh, is, is a black risk, uh, is a black swan. Uh, it's not, uh, it, you can't imagine it until it's in front of you. And then you go, oh, of course, I should have seen that. No, of course. I think it's really interesting. Um, the points Talib makes around, makes around, I'm sure you could probably do it a little bit more justice than I, but I'll, I'll give it a go. So there was a, also something that I listened to your, um, your lecture on this is the Talib Turkey isn't yes. it where they're they're born they're cared for their well-being increases and then thanksgiving and christmas hits and they're gone and they have no conceivable way of of knowing that's coming and that was something that i thought was a really useful analogy i guess yeah based on previous experience everything told them that the world is a wonderful place to live and everyone looks after us and life gets better and better and better and better until christmas arrives or thanksgiving and suddenly they get the chop they couldn't have imagined it it was outside of all their their experience until it actually happened. Excellent. Perfect, David. So just before we delve a little further in the detail, I suppose to give some context for our listeners, could you give some examples of black swans that have emerged in recent history? Yes. Uh, we might talk about very recent history, like the last 18 <laughs> months in a minute, yeah. because I think there's, that's a special case in point. But um, things that we couldn't have conceived of, I guess you might think about uh, the internet and social media, for example. You know, um, 30 years ago there's no no way we could have imagined that all of the world's knowledge is available in a small little device in, in the palm of your hand instantly you can communicate instantly with people on the other side of the world with lots of them with with video with you podcasts, know a lot of these exactly. things like, like how could you imagine that um or um how about the fall of the berlin wall the, the capitalism communism um sort of di dialectic that was always there and then suddenly in the late 80s uh, you know, the Berlin Wall came down, communism collapsed, the Warsaw Pact fell apart uh, and the world changed. That was inconceivable. We couldn't imagine it. Perhaps more recently, we've got the migrant crisis in 2015 or the, the global financial crisis in 2008. Nobody saw those things coming uh, and they had huge impacts. So when you look back, you could have seen the interconnectedness of the financial world or the way that wars in the Middle East would have led people to you know, mass movements of people. We didn't see it until it happened. Um, so a lot of these things, you know, are, are, are big uh, and these are global things. So we could also talk about business examples like Kodak and the digital camera, uh, you know, some of those, U U the rise of Uber, or Airbnb, some of these digi digital uh, disruptive innovations. Uh, and they're obvious afterwards, but beforehand, you know, you have no idea that these things are even possible. No, of course. I think um, I think one that you alluded to earlier as well was Brexit, which was which was something that I get. I guess is would you could class Brexit as a black swan as well, given that there was a referendum, that there was a chance that it could go either way. I guess it was an absolute left field curveball that it actually happened. But would you still consider that a black swan? Yeah, I, I have thought about it that way in the past. I'm not so sure now. When you've got a yes no, uh, you know, referendum with a yes no answer, I guess it's conceivable that yeah, it course. could go one way or the other. And so, with the first of Talib's characteristics, that a black swan is inconceivable. Uh, then perhaps it doesn't qualify. Although really everybody, it seems, thought we would stay in the European Union, even exactly. those who wanted to leave. So for some people, and this brings another interesting nuance to the black swan, for some people it's inconceivable and for others it's not. So something which might be a black swan to one organisation or one industry sector or one family, one individual, might not be. It might be perfectly obvious to other people with a different view of the world. No, exactly. And I think that leads us on quite nicely to 
the coronavirus pandemic. So I'm sure everyone will be interested to hear Black Swan or not coronavirus. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And there's a seven minute video that I recorded in March 2020. You'll find it on the, the Risk Doctor video YouTube channel, which just explains why. And since uh, it, it's it's completely not inconceivable or unpredictable. Uh, we had Spanish flu in 1918. We know that a global coronavirus respiratory virus pandemic is possible, not just possible, but it's happened. And if it's happened once, it could happen again. And even if you go to uh, the World Health Organization or um, even in the UK, we have a national risk register and a global respiratory pandemic was the number one risk in the very first edition of the UK national risk register. Um, we had simulations. We had even in September 2019, there was a conference about uh, um, uh, respiratory virus, uh, coronavirus <laughs> pandemics. It was completely predictable and predicted. And there's a, a WHO report that came out in October 2019, giving seven actions that governments needed to take in order to prepare. And they all went, yeah, very good. We'll do that later. Yeah. And then it was too late. So it, it certainly was not a, a black swan. But there are black swans which have arrived out of the pandemic. And I think that's also important to say. So things like um, lockdown. Um, I was in South Africa with my wife in February 2020 um, and watching how this thing was developing. And there were some cases back in the UK, quite close to where we live. And then Italy got it. And uh, I said to my wife, you know, China had locked down Wuhan and, and that province. I said to her, that could never happen in Italy you know, or in Europe or in any of the kind of the Western democracies. We, we yeah. just couldn't lock down society. It won't happen. And then it did. <laughs> and we got back to the UK on the very last plane that left Cape Town and we arrived the day before lockdown started. And so that, I think, lockdown and the, the closing of international travel, all of those things, mask wearing and so on, that has been a black swan. And yeah. then the other black swan that came out of the coronavirus pandemic, I think, is the debt levels that uh, the governments have racked up, you know, trillions of pounds, dollars um, of debt. And that is going to have a massive impact. And it was completely unforeseen. Conservative government, all of this debt. I mean, how do, how do, we, how do we imagine that? Um, and then the, the impact on the global supply chain. And now the new variants and the impacts that, that there are going to be from those. Um, these things, I think, you know, are true black swans, but coronavirus itself, not. Interesting. So one of my thoughts when I was looking into and doing some research on this um, on this episode, David, is I suppose how companies, organizations, countries even or individuals might tackle black swans previously to the coronavirus. Do you think that, as I mentioned, organizations, countries will be now more receptive to proactively tackling black swans? following the coronavirus pandemic? I, I think it will vary. Um, some will, and some will, you know, have their eyes open to the possibility that even though these things are inconceivable and unknowable, we can still prepare for them. And others, I think we are hearing some that say, oh, risk management failed. You know, why didn't you tell us about these things? And, uh, you know, you should have warned us in advance. And a lot of the risk guys are going, we did. We did tell you all about these things. You just weren't listening. Yeah. Uh, or you were listening and you didn't take action. So there is that kind of debate as to whether risk management dropped the ball before uh, a black swan arrived or whether, in fact, it is the most important thing and there needs to be a, a, a better access to the decision makers. Uh, and my most recent book, uh, uh, Making, Making Risky and Important Decisions, is really trying to take that idea on to say, you know, we've got to get the risk message heard in, in the decision making room um, because risk is such an important part of, of the decision making context. Um, so I, I, I think some organisations will, will respond positively and say, yeah, we missed it. We need to do better. And others will say, no, you missed it and we're not going to listen to you again. Um, I think perhaps one of the best examples, there are some great examples of um, organisations that responded well to a black swan after 9-11. And obviously that was a, a tragedy and we've just had the 20th anniversary, but there, there are organizations who were hit really hard, but had good business continuity plans that have built in resilience that, uh, that responded really fast and, and flexibly um, and survived and actually thrived as a result of 9-11. Yeah. And uh, you know some, some organizations disappeared forever and others just rose to the top because of the way that they were pre-prepared. Amazing. So, yeah, I think that leads quite nicely onto a point that you've already touched on briefly, but I'd nevertheless I'd be quite interested to hear 
in a little bit more detail your thoughts. So in terms of black swans, then, obviously something as large as not necessarily the coronavirus, but the effects of that can be quite objective. Can black swans also be subjective? So can they exist for one person, community, country, organization, whatever the, that the case may be, but not another? Yes, I, I think that is true. Um, so if it's something which is inconceivable and outside of your worldview, if different people or companies have different worldviews, different views of, of, of how, the, how the world works, uh, then they can conceive of different things. So something which is conceivable to somebody might be inconceivable to somebody else. And a lot of this is culturally driven. Uh, so things, I was talking to somebody um, about the sort of uh, the, the, the dominance of men in business and the dominance of men in society. And he said, well, it's obvious it's always been that way. And I said, but not in Africa and not in, in parts of Asia, which are matriarchal societies. And for this particular person, you know, a white um, middle-aged uh, English businessman um, from a particular sort of background, he couldn't conceive of a world where men were not dominant. Wow. Uh, but it exists in Africa. It was inconceivable to him. But I've been there and, you know, I've travelled and I've seen other cultures. So, yes, certainly I think, um, you know, your, your worldview does shape. It, it provides lenses that you look through. Um, and for some people, um, they're, they're, well, they're different between different people. And I think, you know, that whole area of emotional intelligence and emotional literacy and becoming self-aware, understanding your own sources of bias, you know, seeing your lenses and being able to, to take them off, um, choosing to be intentionally more aware of things that are outside of your current frame of reference, um, drawing in uh, perspectives from other people and, and, and different perspectives, I think is really helpful. And we need to, to get more of that. Excellent. Excellent. So this next question, David, may seem a little silly, um, given that true black swans are inconceivable and just so to even be moderately aware of them by definition means that they aren't a black swan, I suppose. Um, but I'll ask nevertheless, so what black swans are coming next or at the very least, how do we do we at least try and catch a glimpse of them or is that even possible? Yeah. Um well, I can't tell you because exactly as you say, if I if I say something, it's conceivable. Um, so for something to be inconceivable for me, I can't tell you what it is. Um, but there's some quite good work done um, by a number of organisations which uh, have identified kind of causes of black swans, things in the context or in the environment, uh, which give rise to things that we weren't expecting. So the International Risk Governance Council, IRGC, wrote yeah. a report actually in 2010, long, long time ago. Um, but it lists 10 characteristics, 10 uh, factors of things that uh, that could arise uh, or that, that exist. And, and when they combine together, uh, they give rise to things that we weren't expecting. Um, so that's one, one area. The other is uh, complexity science. So the Sinefin um, um, model, for example, or uh, some of these complexity system dynamics, systems thinking, where you, you understand how things have unexpected interactions and, and uh, um, um, connections, and those give rise to unexpected outcomes. Um, the uh, World Economic Forum Global Risks Report, for example, published every year uh, called Global Risks, um, that talks about trends, things that have come out, out of the past, which might be significant in the future, talks about how things are relating together. A number of these things are good sources of kind of uh, horizon scanning. Yeah. So you might not see the black swan itself until it pops up in your face, but you might be able to see the conditions that would allow one to be hatching somewhere. And if you spot those conditions beginning to, to, to bubble up, then maybe you need to just sharpen up your preparation and be ready for something, even if you don't know quite what that something actually is. Excellent. Yeah. When I was, um, when I was making a note of that question, I was like, I'm going to have to allude to the fact that this is probably a bit of a silly question given black swans, a true black no swans. No such thing as a least. bad question. <laughs> true black swans, at least, are, are completely inconceivable. Like you say, it'd be like us coming across, I think you mentioned in one of your lectures, a pink swan now. It's just so far out of the realms of possibility. Mm. But I mean, you know, maybe, maybe Boris Johnson is, is an alien, you know. I mean, that's stupid, you know. And if it turned out to be true. <laughs> yeah, heard it here first. Um, excellent. Thanks, David. So just moving on to the phrase hunting the black swans, then, as you probably will have noticed from the uh, the title of this episode. Um, so if black swans are inconceivable, if they're unknowable, does that mean that they are unmanageable? So 
what could we possibly do to prepare for something that is outside of our frame of reference or is inconceivable? Yes, I think that's a really great question. This is the key question. So once you understand these things exist, even though we can't conceive them, and when they arrive, they're going to be big, then we, then we have the question, well, what do you do about that? And yeah. if it's unknowable, does that mean it's unmanageable? In a sense, it does, because you can't respond to a, the specifics of something that you can't see and you don't know what it might be until it's, it arrives in front of you. But there are quite a lot of things we can do generically to prepare, because the, the important thing is that a black swan, whatever it is, has a large impact. And so we can actually prepare for the impact side if risk is uncertainty that matters, and we don't know what the uncertainty is, but we know why it might matter, we can protect ourselves against the mattering side, even if we don't know what the uncertainty side might be. So then what we need to do is, is to perhaps un, uh, conduct a vulnerability assessment, understand what our key objectives are and where the, the areas of weakness within that are. If something happened that we weren't expecting, even if we're not sure what it was, how would that affect us? And can we protect ourselves and mitigate the effects in advance. So this is where we enter the whole area of resilience, which has been a growing, uh, a growing interest in business for 20 years, probably. Yeah. Um, but I think resilience is the key to preparing for something that we can't imagine happening, which if it does happen, has a big impact. So what we say is, you know, just imagine that half of my staff couldn't come to work. I don't know why that might happen. It could be a pandemic, it could be some sort of critical infrastructure problem, it could be terrorism, it could be, I, I don't know, it could be, it doesn't really matter. If half my staff can't come to work, what am I going to do? Or if my, um, you know, my supply chain suddenly shuts down overnight and things that are normally available just in time are only available with a year's notice, I can't, how would that happen? I can't imagine how that would happen, but if it happened, what would we do about that? Yeah. And so we, we conduct this vulnerability assessment and then try and protect ourselves in advance from something, anything, whatever it might be, by developing resilience. Now, the, the idea of um, uh, resilience is, is obviously has multiple levels of, of uh, implementation or application. You know, we can be personally resilient in our character and our nature. And I mentioned emotional intelligence as one of the ways towards that. We can build resilient projects uh, through putting in appropriate contingency and flexible processes and backup resourcing, all those things. We can have resilient organizations uh, in, in terms of the way that we make decisions and the way that we um, uh, have um, not just single sources of, uh, of um, or single points of failure. We can be societally resilient as well. And there's a number of different sort of areas within that. But I think it's, it's down to each individual family, organization, project team, organ, um, business, you know, to, to make those decisions and see how they apply to us. Excellent. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I quite liked that you summarized around resilience was the bounce back ability and the cocoa, I think it was, keep on keeping on, um, yes. which I thought was really useful. So again, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but for anyone who may be thinking of this at home, so traditional risk response strategies like your avoid, your transfer, except they, they aren't applicable to, to black swans. No, I think a number of traditional risks will roll out when a black swan arrives. And so we do need to be alert to those and standard risk management approaches. Uh, you mentioned uh, they apply then. And I should just say you mentioned avoid, transfer, mitigate. You only mentioned threat related responses. Don't forget that risk includes opportunity. So it's not just avoiding and mitigating and transferring. It's also exploiting and sharing and enhancing opportunities. And it's very important to see that black swans are not only negative. You know, if we talk about, say, social media or about the fall of communism or some of these things, actually, they've had some really positive impacts as well. And so what we have to do in our resilience is to say not just be prepared for negative impacts, things that might be really bad coming from some unexpected black swan and we'll protect ourselves. But we also have, need to have strategies on the shelf ready to go if some really positive thing happens as a result of an unexpected black swan arriving. So, you know, some, some great thing turns up and suddenly we find, oh, we could do this now. We'd never thought we could, but we're, we've got all the plans and the resources ready to go. And you think about, you know, home working, for example, um, you know, those organizations that have grasped that opportunity, transformed the way that they work, have cut their costs, have got their office overheads down, you know, have, have increased efficiency, done all sorts of things because they grasped the upside opportunity that the black swan of the lockdown produced. 
And so it is important just as a, as a little byline, you know, you mustn't get trapped into that thinking that all risk is negative, including the risks that come from black swans. There's huge opportunities available. Certainly, yeah, that's uh, definitely a faux pas from my point, especially as a risk professional. But um, but yeah, no, excellent. Thanks, David. So lastly, just in regards to resilience, I guess, adaptability, flexibility from um, from that perspective and, and responding to these black swans, how do we build resilience and adaptability and flexibility into our businesses and projects and, and be better prepared for the emergence of, of black swans? I think personal resilience comes from our character. Initially, some people are just kind of more, more tolerant of ambiguity and able to kind of bounce back easier. Others perhaps, you know, are, are a little more fragile. And so we do need to develop the way that, uh, that we respond to uncertainty, the way that we handle ambiguity uh, and things happening that we weren't expecting. And there are quite good sort of mental approaches that we can use to help us with that. Um, and organizations, we say that people are our most important resource. Uh, one of the things an organization or a business can do when it's thinking about resilience is to make sure that its people are resilient. So when suddenly I can't do my work in, in the way that I've always done it, and I suddenly get a panic attack, is there any help available from the organization? Um, so when we're going to change our working processes as a result of something unexpected, can I give my people the, the necessary support that they need in order to, to flex with it? Yeah. Um, so I think personal resilience is really important. Um, I mentioned for projects, processes, um, contingency management reserve, backup plans, built-in redundancy, use of, uh, of agile uh, methodologies, some of those sort of um, um, repetitive, adaptive uh, processes. Those can be quite useful. You might be doing that anyway, or you might have that on the shelf as a kind of backup, uh, the ability to crash your critical path, all of those sort of standard techniques. And of course, risk management and of course, change management are really, really important. Um, and then the same at the, the business level. So not being tied into one way of working with very rigid processes and approvals, uh, making sure that we have the ability to flex and adapt when we need to. Um, you know, it, it applies right the way from top to bottom. Excellent. Fantastic, David. So just to conclude then, obviously we've established that change is inevitable and, and oftentimes invisible and is something that we, we can't control. Um, what would be a final point to summarise what, what we've discussed today? Well, I think often people say, you know, a lot of risks are outside of my control as a more general point. You know, my competitor might do something or the regulator might do something or, or the weather might, you know, I can't control these things. And so I can't do anything about them. I'm just a victim of, of changing circumstances or a victim of uncertainty. And black swans show us that actually we can always do something. There's always something we can do, even if the circumstances are outside our control, even if they're outside of our ability to conceive them. And what we control is what we can control is our response. So I can be ready, ready for anything, not ready. I have to be ready for the things I can foresee, of course. And yeah. that's standard risk management. But if you say something is outside my control and therefore I can do nothing, it's just not true. Yeah. We don't control the weather, but we take an umbrella or we put on sun lotion. So we're responding to something which is outside of our control. And I think my message to individuals and to project teams and to businesses uh, when we're thinking about black swans is don't feel like a victim. There's always something you can do. Be prepared for something, for anything. Look for the things that would hit you. Do your vulnerability assessment and work out how to protect the things that matter the most and be ready and then when you see the thing coming and hitting you, then you can implement those responses that are pre-prepared. We can always do something. We're never victims of uncertainty. Excellent. No, that's fascinating. Thanks so much, David. I've, um, I've really enjoyed this episode and um, just the preparation for it as well, listening to your content to, um, to sort of fire some questions has been excellent. So thanks so much for that. Um, well, I've enjoyed it too. So thanks for the opportunity. It's been great. No worries, David. No problem at all. So where, where I always finish with these things is this is a geared a little bit more towards people who might be listening at the start of the career. If you could give yourself a piece of advice that you know now that you didn't know at the start of your career in terms of risk management, what would that piece of advice be? Yeah, I, I think for me, my big uh, enlightenment, my big insight, uh, which happened around the late 90s, was to recognize that risk includes opportunity. So initially, I think a lot of us see, you know, the world is threatening, it's a difficult place, it's complex, it's uncertain, it's changing, and we kind of feel, you know, we're not happy with that. 
Um, I think what I discovered early on in my risk career was that some uncertainties can be good for us. And so I've learned in time to grasp those opportunities and to run towards them and embrace them, uh, whilst also protecting myself from the bad ones. So I think uh, my advice would be to look for opportunities and embrace them fully and make the most of, of, of every opportunity that presents itself to you. We need to take risks, but we need to take the right risks and we need to take the right risks safely. So I would encourage people to look for the upside opportunities and embrace them with both hands. Certainly, it's excellent advice. I think a perfect example is I've been working in risk just over a year and even I sometimes still fall foul of, um, I don't want to say forgetting about it, but neglecting it. Um, the episode I did with Peter Simon was all around upside risk management. Mm. Is it a waste of time? Which, uh, which Peter articulated really well. So if you haven't listened to that one yet, go and give it a listen. But no, thanks so much, David. Lastly, if anybody wants to get in touch with you in regards to anything that we've discussed today or, or just anything else, risk management, what would be the best route for them to get in touch? Um, I think email is nice and personal and direct. So david at risk-doctor.com. You can find me at uh, the risk.com, risk.com website, the risk doctor video YouTube channel. Um, so do please reach out and get in touch. I'm quite happy to answer questions. Excellent. And I'll, um, I'll include David's details in the podcast notes below. But um, other than that, David, thanks so much for, for uh, coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm sure our audience have absolutely loved it. Thank you again. I've, I've enjoyed it too very much. Thanks, Pat. No worries, David. Take care. Thank you.